simply, I don't know what motivated them at that point to, um, to become as angry as they did. But they did, and by the end of that day, the assistant district attorney told me that he thought I was a liar and that if I did not reveal the name of Pam Willis's killer right then and there, that I would take his place in court. I didn't know, and um, he kept his word. And I was soon charged with first degree capital murder and stood trial for it. So the, the message was, if you don't tell me who did it, we're going to try you as the person who did it. Yeah. He told me that to point blank right to my face, that that would be the, uh, the outcome. There were detectives sitting there, and there was an attorney sitting there. Uh, an attorney that I didn't ask for, they provided me with an attorney to try and make it all look uh, legal, what was going on that day. Um, Fortunately for me, over the years, um, there, there are people in the legal community who keep an eye out for that kind of thing, whether it's the ACLU or other organizations who insist on strict compliance with the, uh, with the U.S. Constitution. It was that one circumstance of the prosecution that kept public interest in the case and ultimately helped save my life was that they told the juries that I faced that the evidence that they collected at the crime scene on the night of Pam's death, uh, physical evidence, all belonged to me and therefore I had to have been the perpetrator. Unfortunately, none of the juries that I faced ever asked the question, if the evidence matched him, why didn't you arrest him the first time you spoke to him? Why did you let him walk out the doors and remain free for two and a half years to continue a life of crime and drug abuse? Why didn't you arrest him? It was illogical, it didn't make any sense, and it, um, it kept that interest uh, over the years. Uh, people on the outside, it kept them interested in the case, which ultimately uh, resulted um, two decades later in the Innocence Project in New York City. Uh, officially stepping in and uh, undertaking my representation and uh, securing my release. After 22 years. So, <coughs> there's not time uh, during the course of this interview to cover all the things uh, that you maybe reflected on or all the things that you thought um, during those 22 years. Um, could you share some things that come to mind uh, for our viewers that would give them a sense of how you felt as a, as a person who was innocent of the crime of the murder that was being held uh, on death row? I think first and, more, and, and foremost was the betrayal. I was raised in a military family. They weren't. Um, overly patriotic, but they taught me to trust my government, to trust the judicial system, just like my teachers in school did. Um, most people are surprised when I tell them that after I was charged with first degree murder and the district attorney's office filed the bill of particulars, the instrument which advises the court and the public that they're going to seek the death penalty in, in that particular case, even after they did that, I wasn't frightened. I, I believed those things that my family had taught me and that my teachers had taught me in school, that you know, we are a nation of laws and we, we obey the Constitution. That's what's supposed to separate us from uh, other countries around the world who don't respect human rights, uh, uh, due process of law, that uh, we are distinguished from those countries for that very reason, because we have a Constitution and we obey it, and I believed it. Um, even up to the point where the trial began, the first one, I believed that, that I would be okay, that I would have the, my proverbial day in court, that my attorney would represent me faithfully, that the judge would see to it that um, proper procedures were followed, that the law was obeyed uh, in the prosecution, and that 
uh, the truth would come out. Unfortunately, that's, that is, that's not what happened. Um, again, it's far too long to go into, but it was a, uh, um, the principal uh, uh, transgressor was a woman named Joyce Gilchrist. She was the head of the forensics department in Oklahoma City at the, at the police department. She told the jurors that who had uh, uh, been chosen uh, to decide my fate that uh, all of the biological evidence that had been collected from the crime scene belonged to me, and therefore I must have been in violent contact with Pam at the time of her death. And it was perjury. It, it wasn't true at all. Um, when my attorney was unable to combat that testimony, uh, not just because of his incompetence, but because I was poor, and I was unable to hire the, the um, experts who could come in and demonstrate for the jury uh, the, the numerous problems that, that have since been identified uh, with her testimony and her methodology. Um, to skip to the end of the story, and that is the basis of the conviction, that uh, these, these uh, statements that were made by this woman to those jurors, um, it is the reason why I was found guilty. Um, I protested you know, the, the entire time, as did my family and subsequent attorneys that were hired to represent me, that it simply couldn't be true. They couldn't explain that two and a half year gap that if, if, if this evidence matched me, I should have been arrested. And we couldn't get a judge to listen to the argument that there was a, a flaw here, there was, there was a problem with this.